नाचे हम तो दीवाने मस्ती के है ये गाने छेड़ा छेड़ी आंख में चोरी अपना बहाना गाती होली My name is Charlie Coker. I'm the executive director of Asia Society Southern California. Good afternoon from Los Angeles. Welcome to our program, The Power of Photography, a fireside chat with the renowned photographer, Steve McCurry. Um, our moderator for this evening will be Peter Fetterman. Peter has been involved with photography for more than 40 years as a filmmaker, collector, and of course, owner of the eponymous Peter Fetterman Gallery. Um, the gallery contains one of the largest inventories of classic 20th century photography in the US is located here in Los Angeles. Um, if you're interested in purchasing any of Steve McCurry's photographs that you see today or otherwise, um, please contact Michael Hewlett um, with the code Fireside and a portion of the sale proceeds will be donated to the Asia Society of Southern California. So without further ado, um, I will turn it now over to Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you everybody for listening in today. I, I think Steve's photos have even more resonance, uh, particularly in the era in which we're living in now. There's such a great humanity, there's such a feeling of that we're connected. We're all going through this together, wherever we are in the world, uh, no amount of money or status can uh, shield us all from this common terrible thing we're going through. But uh, it's great to see you, Steve. I, I can only imagine, uh, I think you must be in the Guinness Book of Records for the photographer with the greatest um, mileage available uh, in the history of photography. How has the last year, it, it must be so traumatic for you not to be able to jump on a plane at a minute's notice. Uh, Steve, we can't hear you. Mike. Uh, okay, how's that? I can hear you now. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> and I was saying, you, you, and I, you and I, Steve, are old geezers, and we, <laughs> we, we find it hard to keep up yeah. with all of the, the Zoom sophistication subtleties, yeah. right? I think I got it here. Anyway, it's great to be You're with here. you, Peter. Great to be here. Uh, yeah, you know, my uh, life has changed in the last year. I, I was traveling uh, continuously. Uh, you know, spent a lot of time in Asia. Uh, last year, my last trip, this time last year was to, uh, I was in Hong Kong, uh, then Bangkok and then Myanmar. Uh, and I spent uh, like about two months there and it was wonderful. I came, I came home, I uh, flew to New York and suddenly boom, the whole country was shut down. Do you have withdrawal uh, symptoms like I'm, I'm not, I don't have to hustle through an airport today. Uh, I got, I'll tell you, I, I, what I don't miss is waiting in line, uh, you know, for security, baggage claim, uh, customs, and, um, you know, bags getting lost and trying to get a car or a taxi. It, it was, it was a, it was, that part of traveling wasn't fun. So the last year has been a kind of vacation from the, from all of that madness. Well, I, you know, since, you know, what happens in the interim was I've moved to Philadelphia um, and um, I've been spending a lot of time with my family. I've been going through my archive, uh, working on, a, I will have done two books <laughs> during this COVID period. Wow. Um, I'm working on a book right now on, uh, children around the world, which is uh, is great because I, I have a four year old daughter. <laughs> and how so has that changed? How has that changed your approach to photographing other people's children? Now being a dad, maybe later on in life, 
it, it must have some kind of very profound effect for you. Well, you know, the good part about it is that since it's my book, I can put in as many pictures of her as I want to. Right. So I'm, I'm Do you have to get her permission? <laughs> yeah. Uh, my daughter's a not, she's a very difficult subject. She caught on early that, you know, she's decided she didn't want to have her need to take her pictures. So every time the camera comes out, she, she, she runs Do you and have a pictures. preferred profile side. Does she say, oh, shoot me from this one, please, Daddy? <laughs> well, she, she loves, she does, you know, once you get her started, she does kind of, will kind of vogue for the camera, so to speak. She's not, a, she's not like Beyonce. She's not a little diva. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she's great. Actually, she's wonderful. And That's I have uh, of she's tons great. of good pictures of her. <laughs> but uh, it, children are difficult, I mean, uh, in general. Y you have to take what they give you. You know, you can't manage them, you can't direct them, you can't say, you know, stand here, stand there, um, or smile or don't smile, or, you know, they, they just kind of do whatever they want. And you just have to be quick right. and, and take that because, you know, the situation kind of deteriorates. You have to get it, you gotta have, you have to start early because it's not gonna get better. They're gonna end up just running away. So, uh, it's okay though. I, I, it's a challenge. It's a I want to. I want to start with a, a kind of serious question, and I always ask the same question when I interview uh, incredible people who have ach achieved incredible things. And it's a quote from a, a favorite book of mine by Viktor Frankl called "Man's Search for Meaning." And these are the words: "Don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target." the more you're going to miss it. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue, and it only does so as an unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself. What, what do you think your cause is, or has been your cause, and is your cause? Well, I think uh, just trying to show the commonality, the shared humanity, that we, we have, but you know, that quote is so interesting because when I go out on the street, uh, you know, photograph, walk around, you really can't be uh, looking too deeply. Uh, you can't be really thinking about your photography or, you know, I'm under this pressure to go out and do something wonderful. You just have to make yourself open to whatever happens in front of you. You go out, you think, what, well, I'm alive. This is a great day. I'm going to go walk around and enjoy myself and see what the world has to offer. Talk to some people on the street, uh, play with the, you know, a dog or whatever, and just let things kind of, you know, just let it slowly evolve and never force it. And then after a while, you start to see things and you get into kind of a, a zone into sort of a meditative state. And then it kind of opens up and you see something here, you see something there, you walk around for half an hour, nothing happens. But then all of a sudden, you know, something, some magic is, is there. So it's, it's really, um, I always say, you know, you gotta go to the right place. You have to be in the right location and understand that even if you don't make any good pictures, that day or that morning, at least you've had a great walk. You've been out, fresh air, meet people. And so um, I always try and go to a place that I would want to be anyway, even without the camera. What, so, do you think was, what do you think your genesis was to preparing you for this? Anything in your childhood specifically? Did you have a wanderlust at an early age? It, it, all, it came about suddenly when I was... Um, I went to, uh, when I was 19, I was just sort of, you know, kind of aimless. I did a, uh, a gap year after high school, went to Europe, traveled around. And I ended up um, living with a family in, um, in Sweden, in Stockholm. And uh, the boy, who was about my same age, was uh, an amateur photographer. And uh, suddenly we were, on the weekends, we were walking around Stockholm just photographing, just kind of doing this sort of street photography. 
literally just walking around with a camera, which I had never done. I mean, usually, you know, you got a birthday or a wedding or you know, there's some event, take a, you know, click, click, and that's it. But we were, I was following him. We were just walking around observing life and being curious about what was happening. But that was really, I think, the first time I really started getting interested in just, just the art of photography, the beauty of, of just being out free with no script, no agenda, no, no kind of destination, just walking around free and just uh, doing my own thing. And how did you connect initially to Asia? It seems that it's been the subject matter of so much of your work. Again, that was sort of a coincidence, coincidence in the sense that I spent that year in, in Europe and then I went back to school and then, uh, but when I was in Europe, I got, I got hooked on travel. I, I decided that whatever I did in my life, travel had to be part of it. I wanted to go to new cult, see new cultures and new places. So during college, I, I saved my money and went to Africa one summer. Spent about three months wandering around. I was in Sudan and Uganda and Tanzania. Can you, I went back to school and then the next year I went to uh, Central America. In fact, I hitchhiked down to through uh, you know Mexico and Costa Rica and all the countries down to Panama. So you learned no fear at a very early age. It seems oh like yeah, it I was seemed to intimidate you. Yeah, you'll eat anything. You'll go anywhere. <laughs> eat anywhere. Pretty much. So, so you know, kind of fast forward get out of school, uh, get this uh, job on a newspaper, but all the while thinking, you know, my, my, my eye, my, my mind was set on going to, um, to travel. And I, you know, so I, when I decided I got to save my money and I thought, okay, I'm going to just kind of launch myself into this, you know, empty space going to go you know, traveling. And I, so since I'd already been to Europe, Latin America, Africa. I wanted to go to a new place. And, you know, back in 1978, China was a bit difficult to travel in. Uh, the, the Soviet Union was a bit difficult. But India was this kind of rich uh, culture and a place that was very accessible. So I went there and I was, it was going to be, you know, six weeks. And then I was going to go to the Mediterranean and but that six weeks turned into the two years. I literally, uh, I got hooked. Did your on... family think you were insane? Um... No, I think they just, uh, I, I was a, kind of a free spirit and I was always, you know, wandering around, but they, they were a bit kind of perplexed. <laughs> what's, what's going on with this guy? Um, so I, I, went, I, I, was, I was in India, I went to Nepal, and then sort of at the halfway point, really hot monsoon, and I said, I got to escape all the heat. So I went into Pakistan and up into the mountains. And that's when I got my first introduction to Afghanistan. I met some refugees. Uh, they invited me. To, they wanted to sneak me in to see the, the turmoil there uh, in 1979. And so that was kind of the beginning of, I mean, that was really the- The big one. break. Change that, your that life. That was my break. That, that was really- because that, before that, I was just sort of shooting on my own. And then after my first couple of trips to Afghanistan, I started working on assignment for, you know, Time Magazine. And I, I, I was working, suddenly being published in major magaz magazines around the world. So you transcended from a, 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 a diligent amateur to a real professional pretty quickly. Yeah. And then I, you know, started getting assignments and and um, found myself, uh, you know, working on the, the uh, I, you know, when I was in India, I had traveled by train. Um, Let's talk about one of your images first. One of my yeah. all-time favorite images of yours. Can we can we load that up, Lee? It's yeah, you know, it, the train and the Taj. All right, yeah. So I, um, I wanted to do this this story. You know, I, I was inspired by the writer. Paul Theroux, 
who had written this amazing book called The Great Railway Bazaar. And I read it in India. I was in bed with dysentery and I mean, and I read this book, it was like transformative. I, I thought to myself, I have to do a photo essay on this right. trip across South Asia from Peshawar to into Bangladesh. So, but as I was imagining this story, I thought to myself, you know, the Taj Mahal is the most iconic, well, most iconic, one of the most iconic buildings in the world, but in South Asia, there's nothing that even comes close to that. And I, I thought to myself, I wonder if the train goes anywhere near the Taj Mahal. So I, I went down to Agra, where the Taj is, and lo and behold, right across the river, with just within sight was this enormous railroad yard. And um, so, you know, I was, it was like so lucky to be able to kind of juxtapose this uh, railroad yard. And this, they had this one track, it was, a, it was a shunting track where they would take the locomotives up this narrow, this shunting track. And uh, that's where I made this picture. It was uh, off the main line, they were changing. I mean, my eye immediately goes to, to the red. Oh, the, yeah, yeah. Did you, did you, did your eye immediately go to that when you were there? Was that the focus of the image? Oh, that was just the way it kind of was. And, you know, I think today, this again is 1984. Uh, I think some of that traditional way of dressing, um, you know, for workers, the turban and the, right. the cap, I, I think uh, the Gandhi cap, I think that's, a lot of that's been lost because, um, you know, people around the world are tending to dress you know, kind of in a similar way, and you go into, um, you know, to bed and every, everything looks kind of the same. But I, I'm really proud of this picture. The, um, the, the, this track was was ripped out. It, it's gone, that, that piece of- And there are no more track. steam engines, correct? Oh, there's no more steam engines. Um, so to be able to get that juxtaposition be, between the steam engine and the Taj, was a real piece of history, well, so, so and never to be repeated. That, that's 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 gone. Well, I've looked at this image for so many years, and it keeps bringing me back. Yeah. Another one I'm particularly attracted to is, is the mother and child. Could we put that? Oh in? yeah, yeah. Tell us the story of this, Steve. Well, this is in uh, in Mumbai, uh, Bombay. I was uh, on a taxi going uh, out from the airport back into the city. Um, and this, so it's monsoon, the heavy rain, a lot of traffic. This mother comes up to my car window with her child uh, looking for, you know, uh, some money or whatever. And um, just, just as a reaction, I looked at my camera and I, I took two exposures. Uh, the light changed and off we went. And I, I completely forgot about this situation until I got home and uh, looked at these two pictures. And I thought, that can't be my picture. I don't remember that. Uh, but then I looked at the mount and it had my name on it. <laughs> so I figured, well, it's got to be my picture. Uh, they had completely forgotten about it. But um, to me, it's really, you know, kind of this two worlds kind of colliding where you have, you know, me, the kind of the foreigner, the you know, the tourists or whatever uh, in this air conditioned bubble uh, and the, the world outside uh, on the street, you know, it's hot, it's wet, it's polluted. I mean, it, and, and it's so it. cinematic. I mean, do you think you could not have created this image without having deeply studied cinematography, which you did as a young, young man? I think that was a big influence. Uh, you know, light composition, uh, shapes, um, and, and different, uh, yeah, and again, I think it was just, you know, years of looking and observing and uh, looking at lots of great photographers, looking at lots of film, films and- um, Which photographers yeah. and which filmmakers perhaps influenced you? Obviously, or uh, unconsciously. Yeah, I think, that, I, I think the one, 
the, the obvious choice for me would be Henri Cartier-Bresson, who this this incredible uh, did so many things well. He was you know, a great human eye uh, composition, that decisive moment, getting the kind of the peak uh, bit of action in the picture, the geometry and everything was just kind of perfection. One of the most amazing men I've ever met, and you too, I assume. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah, I always, one of the great kind of terrors and one of the joys of my life was to take a book, one of my, one of my, one of my books, to his apartment, see him and Martine, his wife, and show my work. Because he could be really, tough. Tough. I don't think he was ever rude, but I think if he was felt that you were wasting his time, I think you would have, you would have known it. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I must say he was very kind and very generous with his comments. And um, uh, I was always like, so, uh, you know, a little bit nervous of what his reaction would be. But you know, it, it, one of the great things about, because he had spent a, an enormous amount of time in India and, and Asia as well. And so we had all this wonderful uh, conversations about not only, uh, you know, photography, but, you know, in, working in India, working in China, you know, these great stories. And- uh, He was so well read, he was so literate. And oh, I, yeah. I had the same experience as you did. I. I you know, he was my hero and I went to meet him. And I remember the day, you know, I was so nervous about pushing the button to come in and on 178 Rue de Rivoli and meet him, but he was, he was so amazing. And yeah. Humble yeah, really. I, achievements. Yeah. Uh, to me, he was uh, the best. And, um, you know, I, I, I've learned so much from looking at his pictures even now, uh, I, I think people often say, you know, how do you, uh, what's your advice to a young photographer? I think looking at great work yeah. is, um, you know, is, 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 you don't even have to really even meet the photographers necessarily, all that, that helps, but just to look at their work and see how they solve, you know, problems of composition and light and how they worked and what interested them, you know. I think you both have a lot in common, actually. You're both incredibly humble, considering your achievements. And, uh... As far as film goes, I, I think uh, Kubrick was a great uh, filmmaker. I, I've always loved his, uh, his, his films, and he did so many different things, science fiction and historical and anti-war and paths of glory. And he was a, you know, <laughs> a great filmmaker. But... Um, so, you know, as far as uh, other photographers, uh, you know, I think you'd have to, you know, uh, Walker Evans and, um, uh, you know, um, Dorothea Lang, I think it was a doctor that comes to mind. Yeah. You share that common humanity. I, I want to say one more thing, though, about, um, you know, when I was 12, I was in my grandmother's in her basement. We was, she had this big stack of life magazines. And uh, one, one day I was going through them. I saw this essay on the monsoon by this uh, photographer from New Zealand, Brian Brake. Yeah, incredible. And it just blew me away. And I thought, my God, I got to go. I got to see this for myself. I got to go. I, it, it was just this incredible, the, the, the pictures were just otherworldly. So I kind of filed that away in the back of my mind. And when I went to India and, and kind of lived through two monsoons, I thought to myself, you know, I kind of want to, I want to reinvent uh, Brian's essay and kind of do it my own way. And How do you um, sustain yourself through all these incredibly difficult physical situations you voluntarily put yourself into? You must have a very strong mindset, knowing what you're going into. Be it, you know, animals well, floating in the- Before you go into it, I mean, before you go into it, you don't really understand the difficulties. It seems like, oh, it's gonna be great fun to go there and shoot the monsoon. Uh, and so you kind of embark on that journey, then kind of once you're there, then you, you don't wanna, you don't wanna be, uh, you don't want to, um, uh, disappoint yourself. You, you don't want to uh, fail. 
right. you, you don't want to go back empty handed. <laughs> you don't want to, you know, say, well, I, I was defeated. I, I couldn't do it. I, I wasn't up for the task. And you just have to push forward. And with the monsoon, it was, I remember being in all this sort of water, which was unspeakably dirty with, you can't imagine all the, and I thought, you know what? People are walking through it. I mean, the people living in these mm. places and I just have to jump in, don't think about it, just do it. Is it and, like an adrenaline rush? That you, there was no alternative, you just have to. Yeah, you, you just no alternative. I, other way. Failure is not an option. In fact, you, you kind of almost, you almost say to yourself, you know, I'm gonna do this if it kills me. <laughs> Literally, I, I would rather kind of die than be timid and have, again, kind of come home at the You're end. fearless. I mean, it shows in your work and what you do. You're a kind of, uh, you're a buccaneer. You're a, a heroic <laughs> well, buccaneer. I mean, going into Afghanistan, again, it's another case where you think, well, that's, that's an important story. That'll be, that, that's an important, you know. Well, there is a little photo directly behind me, Steve, uh, which I think people know. Could, could you perhaps talk about it a little and maybe give us some more insight? Could we put up Lee? Could we put up the Afghan girl? Thank you. Pretty, uh, pretty iconic photo, Steve. Uh, however many times I've seen this reproduced in books and in magazines, when I stand next to it, as I am now, it just is a haunting, haunting image. Talk to us about it a little bit. Well, when I... I um... I had spent a lot of time in Afghanistan over five years when I made this picture. I was very familiar with the situation. Uh, and I, I was, at this time in 1984, uh, there were literally millions of Afghans who had fled, had been driven out of their country and um, the border was just full of refugee camps, uh, you know, on the Afghan, on the Pakistan side, on the Iranian side. Um, so I wanted to do this kind of study, this sort of project going up and down the border, going into, going into Afghanistan and photographing all this movement. And one morning I was in a refugee camp outside of Peshawar. Um, and I was almost ready to, to leave and go back to, to my hotel to have lunch. And there was this tent, it was a girls' school. And I heard the, the voices coming and out of the tent. I thought, okay, well, let me just stop in here and see what's happening. And, you know, then I can go to lunch. So I, I walked in, I presented the teacher with my permission papers to be in the camp. And as she was kind of looking at that, I, I surveyed the classroom. I noted this, that one girl, Sharbat Gula, caught my eye. And, and kind of suddenly, like every, it was like uh, I was in this sort of, you know, dream. Everything disappeared and all I could see was her and her set of eyes. And I, I knew, I, I knew that that was the only picture I wanted to make and I had to do it. You were so certain. You were in a trance and you, this was, this was it. Uh, so I kind of came up with a strategy to photograph some of the other girls, very slow, be very friendly, very respectful. And um, after a few minutes, I asked the teacher if I could photograph her since I had already photographed many other students. So she came over and sat in front of my camera. And uh, you know, I didn't direct her, I didn't speak her language. Or, so I think part of her gaze, apart from the fact that she's an orphan and you know, living in this refugee camp, I, I think there was a curiosity about you know, who is this guy and, and why is he dressed funny and why, why doesn't he speak our language? And, What's that, that thing? She had, she had never been photographed right. in her life. So I, she, she sat there, I, I squeezed off a few exposures. Uh, it, it looks very still, 
but outside the frame, they're all the, her classmates running around and you know laughing and screaming and dust being kicked up. So but I, I was able to get a few you know exposures, and then after a minute, maybe two, she just got up and walked away. I mean, she didn't know it was a, she. It wasn't like a, a kind of a formal you know, sitting or whatever, she just figured that, you know, that it was over and she got up and, and left. And um, Were you surprised how people reacted to this image once it was released to the world? Well, I, I knew it, there was a, it was a strong image. It was one of those rare cases where you're just there and this thing sort of happens in the sense that uh, the light coming from the outside of the tent was kind of perfect on her face. The background of the tent, uh, you know, complemented with, with the red of her, her shawl. It was a wonderful kind of a color balance. Uh, she, she had this, uh, her face was a bit dirty. You could sense that she was, uh, you know, this poor girl. Uh, she had a rip in her shawl. You can see the rip in her, her shawl. And, um, there's a kind of a raw quality to it. And um, I, I, you know, so it, it ended up, you know, a picture kind of either gets a momentum or sometimes they're, they seem great in the beginning and then they, they kind of fade. But this but is like Migrant Mother. It's become one of the most- Kind of ga gathering photos in the history of photography. It's haunting. And, um, it's amazing uh, people all over the world uh, know this picture wherever I happen to be. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's just, um, you know, I, I, it's, I'm really proud to have been the photographer who made it. So. As you should be. <laughs> it's extraordinary. Can we look at the next image called Dust Storm? Here again. Oh, no, this boy in mid-flight. Tell us about this. Well, th I, you know, I, I, I spent years in India, I have such a great kind of respect and admiration for the culture, the people, the, the history. The, it, it, it's really, uh, I think it has such depth culturally, maybe more than any other country in the world. It goes back thousands of years, all these different religions. Um, so I, this is one town uh, called Jodhpur in Rajasthan, and I was, I've been there many times, and this was just after Holi, uh, which was last week, I think, and uh, they had put, the, somebody had put these sort of handprints on the wall for just for the, for fun, and um, so I was walking through the old quarter, the, it's all painted blue, the whole town is blue in this certain area, and I came across this one alleyway and as I kind of stood there, I saw the handprints. Uh, I saw this great design, uh, the bit of okra on the wall. And, and as I was standing there, I saw people coming and going. So I, I started photographing this sort of alleyway. And um, I spent an hour, maybe two. And, and then I, I finished, I kept walking around the town. And then I, I got back to the hotel that night and started looking through my pictures. And I thought, wow, that was... A, amazing composition and uh so i went back again the next day and continued to stand there and um so i, I actually had several other situations with other people there's a I, I, pictures of women coming through the alleyway and men and there's a cow and a dog and all that but I, this was the one i thought to me captured the it was completely spontaneous i mean yes this is me that really captured the spirit of what I was looking for. Yes, perfect composition, such a great mood. Can we look at Dust Storm? Oh no, this is Jodhpur, this is the... Yeah, this, this is that town, town, which is uh, in, in Rajasthan. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's uh, you know, I've been there so many times and you can kind of get lost walking through the alleyways and meet people, it's, it's, just, um, it's just so rich. Uh, there's another, um, I mean, there's so many great cities in, in Rajasthan, India. It's just endless. 
you know, I, I've been to India 80 times, maybe more. And I still haven't scratched the surface. There's so many places that, I mean, you could spend a, five lifetimes. And when you're free to travel again, is that another destination? You're going to go back again? Oh, your, absolutely. Your, your yeah. wish list of places yet, yeah. to, yet to be covered? Yeah, somehow I'm, South Asia, you know, um, Sri Lanka and Nepal up into Tibet, this has been sort of my beat for more than 40 years. Um, I always find myself kind of going back there um, I think you intimidate every other photographer who wants to go now, Steve. So uh, <laughs> it's very much your beat. <laughs> there's a lot of un uncovered ground in India. It's just it's just a beautiful, beautiful place to be. And this the next image, dust storm. Uh, tell us about that one. Well, this goes back to the Brian Brake essay that I had seen in, in Life Magazine, and. Now, I was looking at Brian's his essay, and I, again, I was trying to kind of reinvent that. And he starts his essay off in the period before the rain when it's hot, dusty, unbearable. So I got to, to India a few weeks early to get that parched and unbearable heat. And uh, again, in Rajasthan, and I was... I hired a taxi to go from Jodhpur to Jaisalmer, and just out of the blue came this dust storm, and you could see this wall of dust coming towards us, and uh, as it kind of enveloped the taxi I was in, did everything went, you know, it was just like a fog, it was just wind. I, I, I immediately rolled the windows up, I thought, oh my God, I'm, you know, this is crazy. And I, I wanted to protect my camera equipment because it was, you know. And then it suddenly occurred to me that, wait a minute, this is a dramatic moment. I, I gotta, I can't sit here in the car. I gotta get out of it. So then I, then there was a frantic idea of, well, okay, uh, what am I gonna photograph? What are we gonna right. shoot in the middle of this dust storm? So we're driving and I'm, I'm looking and I saw this group of people who were working on the road who were, had stopped and these women were kind of huddled together, uh, protecting themselves from the dust storm. And um, got my cameras, I thought, you know what? If they get ruined, I mean, I can't, again, be timid. Gotta, gotta do this thing. Got out what were they doing on this road as, as you passed them? What was well, the there had been a drought in Rajasthan for many years and the government had this program where they, were, they would have these day laborers and they would give them, um, you know, 100 rupees a day to work on the road. To, it's like a WPA project. Okay. Exactly, yeah. So they, uh, that's what they were doing. But when the dust storm started and all this wind kicked up, they stopped, kind of huddled together and started singing. And um, I, I just got out of the taxi and ran across this field and made a few exposures. Huh? And how did they all come to be wearing the same garments, the same clothes? I think that's their, their tribe or their caste. Right. Um, it's very traditional. Those particular fabrics, in fact, some of them they no longer use because they're, they're now everything's made in you know, China or this kind of synthetic fabrics. But th th these are more traditional. Uh, Red seems to be a pretty lucky color for you, Steve. <laughs> yeah, well, that that was, uh, I don't know, it was just, yeah, it, it, I think they all were, they were all wearing red. I mean, all, I mean, all the women, even outside the, um, I, I outside think the picture. When we, when we show this image in the, in the gallery, everyone is huddles over it, literally. They, yeah. they can't stop staring at it. Probably my favorite picture. In fact, because of uh, the fact that, um, again, one of these magic moments which you're presented with and you kind of try and rise to the occasion, and come back with something that you, you think is, that works. Well, you've risen to the occasion so many times, Steve. It, it, this, this isn't luck anymore. It's, it's, it's real skill, talent, perception. 
Um, I think that's what sets you apart from everybody else. Isn't that the case? I think you, you can get lucky once or twice, but over a 40 year career to, to come up with this extraordinary body of work, it, there's something else going on. You, yeah, a, a lot of work, a lot of, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, 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 you know, for years I'd get out on the street, you know, before sunrise. I mean, years I did that. <laughs> You know, uh, get on the street at sunrise, work literally the whole day. I mean, you know, work till nine or 10, take a break until, you know, middle of the afternoon, go back on the street. Well, you're, you're, you're flexing your, your muscles, aren't you? You're, you're yeah. flexing your intelligence and your eye. I mean, the moment you stop doing that, you can't create, right? Yeah, I, we stop work now. At, you know, my office stop at five o'clock in the afternoon. I feel like these... Days just beginning. What's going on here? <laughs> I should be you know, well, you, working for another few hours. You never stop looking. That's uh, yeah. that gives you your longevity and this yeah. amazing body of work. Um, let's look at this image of Calcutta. This is it's a lot going on in this photograph. Well, there's few cities in the world that have the flavor, the vitality. The vibrancy, it's just an incredible city. And there's, there's this chaos in Calcutta, which is so beautiful and visually rich. I was at this particular intersection. Um, there was a tram and everything. And I thought there's a mosque down the street. And I thought the best way to get this view would be if I, I need to get up. I need to be, you know, 20 feet off the ground. So I asked my assistant, you know, let's see if we can find, a, go up this building and see if we can get a window. So we went up a couple of floors, knocked on the door. And when did you know it was the time to take the, to press the shutter? There's so many layers of storytelling going on in this image. How well, do you I took, do I took I took several pictures. Right and trying to see everything at the same time, trying to look at all the corners of the picture and trying to put it into my kind of mental computer and, you know, wait, wait for the right moment, especially the tram and the taxi. Uh, the people at us into their, you know, their apartment, they not only let me shoot out the window, <laughs> they offered to give us uh, a cup of tea and we became sort of friends and they were very, I guess flattered that I wanted to photograph, you know, the scene from their from their balcony. <laughs> so it was kind of a win-win for everybody. Was, but I love this. It, to me, it really embodies what I love about Calcutta. Well, there's no other city like it, right? Oh man. So you're going from this chaotic situation to this very quiet, tender portrait of uh, the red boy, as we call him. Yeah. The shot. So this is in, 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 in Mumbai, and they have this celebration of uh, Ganesh, where people come from all over the region, and they will take an image of Ganesh. Sometimes they're very small, they're just, uh, you know, that high, or sometimes they're 10 feet, and they'll take it into the sea and, and deposit it into the Right. Water, but in the process of all this, there's a lot of celebration. There's singing, dancing, and they they throw color similar to holy. Uh, and these these those are some boys in the neighborhood who are taking part in the festivities. Who had, you know, as boys do, they they just kind of went overboard, cover all this color. But this kid, it seems so special. I mean, that's that's your yeah, skill. great eyes, this kind of still moment. I, I asked him and his friends if I could photograph them, and he he just stood there and just looked into my lens, and um, the light was right, and uh, the composition worked, and it was a, kind of a magic moment. You very kindly sent me a, a draft of your new book on children, so you're constantly. Wow. Tell us about the going back to the archive process. What, what is that like and the discoveries you made? 
Well, when you come back from a uh, from a trip, you know you might have thousands of pictures, and um, usually you have you're looking for a particular thing, or, or maybe a couple things, and you kind of devour. You kind of go through and do the selection process, and you you'll pick a few pictures, a dozen or whatever. And then you kind of move on. And sometimes you put that body of work aside and it could be months or years because you're on to kind of the next thing. And sometimes that work will sit kind of without being looked at again, 20, 30, 40 years because you're busy, There's it's not a priority. So in this kind of COVID period, I've been able to go back into work I did right. in the 80s or even the 70s and go back and look at it in, in a different way, maybe in a more historical way um, and, and find those pictures which were overlooked or maybe, you know, styles change the way you, you know, the, the way I kind of look at the world or uh, so much. So I kind of go back and look at it in a different way and the other thing is sometimes pictures which were scratched or too dark or too light, uh, you can salvage now. And so some of these pictures which are just cast aside because of, of, of some imperfection or whatever, uh, they have a new life. So I've been able to find a lot of pictures which, and then of course, how pictures kind of juxtapose. Some pictures work really well with other pictures and sometimes you don't, recognize that uh, at first glance. So um, sometimes and I have time, it's time helps you reappraise things, right? Yeah. The, there are a lot of questions coming in now, Steve, from all oh. over the world. Can we can you can you answer some of them now? Sure. Okay. So the first one is when you returned to find Shabat later, the Afghan girl, and she was a woman, what had changed aside from her age? Well, she was a mother. She had had, I think, three children. Uh, her husband was living in, uh, in the city. She was living in the village. Um, he was making like $1 a day. Um, one of their daughters was, uh, was sick. Um, I, I think life was, as with other Afghan refugees, life was very difficult. So one of the kind of gratifying one of the great things about meeting her again was that we were able to, to help her. And actually, we started a school in uh, in Kabul based on her, and and money was raised to educate these Afghan girls. And we subsequently uh, bought her a home uh, for her in her name. So, um, so some good eventually came out of this yeah, terrible situation. Yeah. So yeah, it's been a, I mean, being a refugee anywhere is, is, is very is a constant struggle. There's another question. If you could only travel to one more place, what would it be? Somewhere new or an old favorite? One place. Yeah. Well, if it was one place, I would probably go to, um, in Asia, should we say, should we just say one place in, yeah. in Asia? Well, anywhere in the world, actually. Well, Italy, of course, would be a strong contender, I must say. <laughs> Italy is, uh, you know, that's another place with such rich art and culture and- And light. Oh and God. light, and, oh my God, on and on and on. It's unbelievable. Um, I, I, of course, India, again, would be a, I mean, you couldn't go wrong with, you had one, place to go to. You Is there can, an area in India you've yet to explore in depth? Um, I, I'm, all, I'm always drawn to places like Ladakh, uh, kind of a Buddhist culture. Uh, I've been there several times. I, the whole Buddhist world to me, it really somehow speaks to me. And I found myself traveling all over the Buddhist world in um, 
you know, China, Tibet, you know, Thailand, Burma, uh, Laos, um, Vietnam, uh, Bhutan, uh, Sri Lanka. I, I've spent years in these places. I, again, it's just it's just something that um, uh, I'm attracted to. Um, that that sensibility, that, that the ideals that they um, teach, really, uh, I find uh, something that really touches well, me. You're following in the footsteps of our friend Henri because later in his life he became very involved. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So right. he's passed on many good things to you and everybody. Especially the, the hair. <laughs> well, it's something we all have to wrestle with, Steve, sooner or later. Yeah. Uh, how has your time in these countries influenced your own theological or philosophical views? You clearly have a deep connection with every subject. Well, yeah, the, the, the sense of impermanence, that, again, I, I, I think the Buddhist view of uh, life and detachment is something that I think is uh, important lessons to learn. I, you look at the, 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 the Buddhas at Bamiyan, which were destroyed by the Taliban. Um, I think from a, Buddha, a Buddhist point of view, I mean, it, it's, things are made. I mean, look at the sand mandalas, which these Tibetan monk, they make this incredibly beautiful sand mandala and then they, it's created and then it's destroyed. Um, it's just the impermanence of, of life. I think there's a lot of great uh, things to learn from, from that. I mean, the, I think there's great things to learn from all over, you know, Asian cultures and um, that we're here and we're going to be gone and we just have to make the most of it and be respectful of each other, uh, of uh, animals and, and um, um, you know, I think that the trouble, the you know, the troubles in the world come from lack of respect, and whether it's a race thing or religious thing or whatever, I always come back to that lack of respect of being the cause of so many problems in the world. I mean, what I'm asking you a personal question here is that even though you've seen so much terrible things in what you've witnessed. How do you keep your positive attitude? What stopped you from becoming well, I think, you know, about humanity? You know, I think there's certain people you meet which restore your faith in, in the future. It's really easy, though, to be pessimistic when you look at so many things happening in the world. Um, so if you look at the big picture, things seem very dire. And... Um, from an ecological point of view, from so many different, but there's so many people doing amazing things, yeah. and they they inspire us to to do better, and uh, hopefully, um, you know, we'll turn this around at some point. The, the world and all the problems, but it, it's it's a challenge, and we'll see if we can do it. Yeah, photography per se cannot change the world, but it can make people aware, I think, yeah. of the issues that need to be to be addressed. I have a couple more questions. Since Buddhism's genesis was in former Ceylon, what is your favorite image taken in Sri Lanka? Do you have a favorite one you've captured there? Uh I think the ones that I, the, the, um, uh, let's see, I, I, I've been to several monasteries in Sri Lanka and it's always been um, somehow wonderful to photograph the, the novice monks mm -hmm. going about their daily activities, studying, cleaning, I mean, sweeping and cooking and whatnot. Something in that range, I would say. Um, it's a beautiful, I mean, there's so many great Buddhist centers in, um, in Sri Lanka. And uh, yeah, I think that's probably the, the, the monastery life in the 
young monks. Well, thank you, Steve. I've got one last question for you. Would you encourage your daughter to follow in your footsteps? Only if she wants to. I think that uh, she should be completely uh, free. I, I would, I would like her to be involved in my um, archive and my legacy and all that if, if she wants to, but I, I think she should be free to do whatever she wants to. As far as, I mean, if, you know, um, if she wanted to be a photographer, I would help her in every way I could, but I think that's 100% her choice. I would never want to impose uh, anything on her or, or could I, you know, I mean, she's, she can't do it now. I, I can't even convince her now, let alone. I think she's roads. very lucky to have you as a father. And you're That's a great true. dad. She is lucky. A great human a being. I and give her a lot. You've been a great a inspiration for me for 30 years. So thank you, Steve. And thank you for doing this tonight. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Charlie. Over to you. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Steve, for an amazing discussion about these remarkable photographs and an even more amazing career. Um, as we mentioned, um, these photographs are available at the Feder Peter Federman Gallery. Um, there's a, um, uh, please contact Michael Hewlett if you're interested. If you use the code Fireside Chat, a portion of the proceeds will be donated to Asia Society Southern California. We hope that you will visit and peruse and, and purchase. Um, some of these incredible iconic photographs. Um, and we also like to uh, let you know about our new program. Our next program will be on um, April 6th at 5.30 Pacific time. Um, we will be reviewing the COVID-19 in the new global investment outlook. Um, we will be joined by Howard Marks of Oak Tree Capital and Gerald Dean Buckingham of BlackRock Asia. Um, we'd also like to encourage you to become a member or to donate if you possibly can to support us in hosting these programs. Uh, we make these programs available for free and um, we hope you will support us so that we can do more. Uh, on that note, I'd like to thank everybody for joining and have a great afternoon, evening or morning, wherever you happen to be in the world right now. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>